email list. Is that true? Okay. I see. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. We'll pass it around. <laughs> and if you have not been here before, we're glad you're here. I'm glad you're here anyway. Molly's glad. Um, you are. I'm glad. <laughs> I think everyone has been pretty busy recently. Mm -hmm. uh, the Barnes and Noble people told me that they had something come up and they were delayed and someone else has been delayed or we would have been I ready. Think society's very busy, yes. <laughs> yes, about tomorrow's the big gala, if you guys haven't heard, and most of everybody involved with the Historical Society has been um, busy with that. That's a big money raiser for the, for the year. It's a big deal for us. So I've been busy preparing, and now I'm going to grab what I prepared and introduce Molly. <laughs> Okay, I do have flyers for um, to, <laughs> for tonight and for next month, so you can be prepared. Um, I'm not going to pass them out now because then you'll be reading them when Molly and I are talking. <laughs> a trick I learned years ago. <laughs> In honor to the speaker, that's right. So I would like to um, tell you what I've learned about Molly. Now she's been with us before, so uh, some of this is, comes from her website and some of it comes directly from Molly. A lifelong fan of for folklore and mythology, Molly Ringel has been writing both contemporary fiction and paranormal fiction for over 25 years. Molly says she was one of the quiet, weird kids in school, and she's now one of the quiet, weird writers of the world. She likes thinking up innovative romantic obstacles and mixing them with topics like Greek mythology, ghost stories, fairy tales, or regular world scandalous gossip. Have you ever thought about writing anything with political <laughs> tones? I don't dare. <laughs> <laughs> it, would be, no. <laughs> it would be fun to go there with our heads instead of someplace else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's into mild, rainy climates, probably not the snow, gardens, <laughs> 80s new wave music, chocolate, tea, and perfume, or really anything that smells good. She has lived in the Pacific Northwest most of her life, aside from grad school in California, and one work abroad session in uh, Edinburgh in the 1990s, and she's also really into the UK. She currently lives in Seattle with her husband, kids, guinea pigs, and a lot of moths. <laughs> They'll be frozen now, yeah. Molly's studies included a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and a Master of Arts in Linguistics. She was a Tri-Delta in college in an old sorority house that was supposedly haunted, which inspired some of the central ideas for her award-winning The Ghost Downstairs, one of her earlier no novels. Molly's Immortal Spring completes her more recent trilogy of novels about the Greek myths and include Pers of Persephone's Orchard and Underworld's Daughter. We've heard those presentations. The book Molly's presenting tonight is The Goblins of Bellwater, which is, according to her fellow author, Kate Ristow, or something like that, a fast-paced and sparkling novel with dangerous spells and unexpected delights. The goblins aren't erythral and magical. They don't sparkle, shimmer, or shine. They repulse and draw you in all at the same time. So guessing that you've probably had enough of other kinds of creatures this Halloween, let's hear about the goblins of Bellwater um, from our three-time presenter of Words Writers in West Seattle. Please help me welcome Molly Ringel. Thank you, Dorothea. That was actually that was an excellent bio. So I, 
I don't think I need to add anything about myself. I think you have a very good summary there. Actually, since you mentioned The Ghost Downstairs, I just want to say that that is now my first audiobook. It was just recently produced, and the narrator is sitting here with us. My friend Melanie is a narrator on audible.com, and she did it for us, and it sounds amazing. So you can find that if you like to listen to audiobooks. It's on Audible now. And that is my first one, and I hope that other books get made into audiobooks too, because I know that that's... Yeah, that's a really popular thing. You can do the housework while you're reading, essentially, one of those, and it's... I like to have them too, so I'd like to see some more. I have to know that older people, not older people. Of course. No, 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 other <laughs> people. Yes, people have lots of audiobooks as well. Good market. It's good, it's good for commuters as well, Art. so... Car trips. So, yes, that was an excellent bio and intro. This is my third talk here, and by now I'm quite familiar with the society and with this BNN, and I appreciate them both very much for hosting us, and especially since it's so close to home for me, and hopefully for most of you. So, and I appreciate you coming in today on this uh, strangely snowy day. Did anyone have a conversation today that wasn't about snow? I, I didn't. <laughs> But it was, I thought it was very fitting because this book is set in winter time. And uh, it, was, it was like a good sign that it snowed all day on this day. So yes, uh, on, by the way, in my past talks and ones I've seen here by other authors, I especially like the ending with the questions and discussions. So certainly be thinking of things you wanna talk about while I'm talking up here. Now this time, unlike my first two appearances, I, I get to depart from Greek mythology. I get to talk about goblins. Indeed, when I finished my Greek myth-based trilogy, which was about two and a half years ago, I was at loose ends when it came to choosing what to write next. And incidentally, not writing anything next, doing something other than writing, is not an option for me. <laughs> I've tried that and I go crazy, so I have to be writing something. Uh, so luckily for such times, I keep a story idea file. That's actually what it's called. It's a word file called story idea file. And I opened that up and I read through the list. It's not a very detailed list on the whole. It's just a couple of lines each, usually for each idea. And one of them was simply, see poem Goblin Market, Christina Rossetti, plenty of paranormal romance fodder. Uh, the reason I had put this line there in the first place was because an online friend of mine had called my attention to this poem back in 2011. At that time, I'd asked a question on my blog about a different poem, and he wrote in a comment, I'll just read you his whole comment here because he tells this story best. This reminds me of a time not so long past when an English lit teacher, let's call her Judith, announced to her room full of 16-year-old charges, including me, that each of us would have to memorize and recite a poem to the class. She suggested anything from the Oxford Book of English Verse. Some of my classmates raced to find the shortest and easiest to memorize. Should you ever need to do this, it's twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> Meanwhile, I took a moment to make sure I was awake and had really been handed such a blank check, then sat down to memorize the Goblin Market. I was looking forward to my classmates' reactions to she cried, Laura, up the garden. Did you miss me? Come and kiss me. Never mind my bruises. Hug me, kiss me, suck my juices. Squeezed from goblin fruits for you. Goblin pulp and goblin dew. Eat me, drink me, love me. Came the day, and alas, I had got no farther than clearer than water flowed that juice she never tasted such before. When Judith woke up, realized what was coming next, and stopped me in my tracks with a frosty... Thank you, Mr. Renfro, that will be all. <laughs> Some people take all the fun out of everything. <laughs> That's, that was his anecdote. And yes, I was very amused by that, and I went and looked up the poem because I'd never read it before, or even heard of it. It is um, <clears throat> Goblin Market by Christina Rossetti, published in 1862. And it's in the public domain. You can read it for free on the internet. And I read it, and then I wrote back to him in my blog comments. Okay, many thoughts here. May have to go into numbered list. One, first impression from reading the excerpt in your comment, because I hadn't read the poem before, was, huh, sounds like something Robert Smith would have liked. 
Uh, who here knows who Robert Smith is? Yeah, <laughs> you guys know. He's the lead singer and main songwriter for the group The Cure, which will help you with point two. Two, <laughs> upon looking it up online, I learned it was by Christina Rossetti, who, yep, was the exact poet whose work, or so I hear, inspired at least a few Cure songs. Three, you are hilariously awesome to pick that to recite aloud. Mischievous <laughs> literature geeks are the best sort. Four, dude, that is a long poem to memorize. You're also impressive. The only poem of any length I can recite is Jabberwocky, like everybody. <laughs> Five, ooh la la, this poem is gold to the paranormal romance writer. And um, yeah, surely even the Victorians noticed the overt biting and sucking going on. Still, I may actually have to stick this in my story idea file and use it sometime. <clears throat> For a modern paranormal romance, however, I'd need more nuance than maiden good, goblin evil. This day and age, after all, it's maiden conflicted, goblin sparkly and heartthrobby. <laughs> <clears throat> there conclude my comments from 2011. So a couple of years ago, in seeking a new story idea, I opened the story idea file, saw that note, remembered the goblin poem, and went and read it again to see what struck me this time. So has anyone here actually read Goblin Market? You have, you know. <laughs> You've read it, of course. As I observed uh, to my friend online, it is a long poem, so I'm not going to read the whole thing out for you here. That excerpt gives you a, a sense of the strangeness and the mood. But uh, this is the summary of it in terms of its plot. There are two sisters living in Victorian times. They're aware of goblins who sell fruit in the mossy woods nearby, but the sisters avoid them because they know they're dangerous. However, one sister gets curious one day and ventures out to them and gets drawn into an enchanted orgy of tasting and sucking all the goblin fruits. When she comes home after that, she isn't herself anymore. She begins wasting away, pines for the goblins, has no energy or joy. Her sister's in despair, worrying about her. Finally, the unenchanted sister goes out to the goblins, endures their taunts and their attempts to shove fruit into her face, but she doesn't let herself taste any. She keeps her mouth shut, even as they're smashing fruit against her face. Then she escapes and goes home and embraces her sister and when the cursed sister kisses her and tastes the goblin fruit on her skin, she's cured. They live happily ever after, though now a good deal wiser about goblins. <laughs> so, what is that about, really, one is tempted to ask. There are a lot of interpretations. I'm not a Rossetti scholar, or even really a literature scholar on a deep level. But what struck me about it as a reader is it's very much like a fairy tale. It's got uh, enchantment and paranormal creatures and deep dark woods and mortal peril and very specific visceral symbolism, all the sucking and smashing fruits. And they name very specific fruits. There's a long list of fruits in the poem. Although what it's a symbol for is up to interpretation. Is it about sex and chastity? Is it about the role of women in society? Uh, is it about stranger danger? drug addiction, the bonds of family? Well, yes, probably, to all of that. And at the same time, on the surface, it's a cool, weird story about a woman affected by goblin magic and her sister who saves her by confronting the goblins. So I decided I would at least write that much, using this poem as my jumping off point. And that is, indeed, what the Goblins of Bellwater is, on the surface, is a woman suffering from goblin magic and her sister who saves her by braving the goblins. But in my version, they are not Victorians anymore. They are in the modern day and they live in a small town on Puget Sound, backed up against the deep dark woods of the Olympic Peninsula. I chose that setting because, of course, it's a place I'm familiar with, but also because fairy tales need deep dark woods. And as we all here know, we have some amazing deep dark woods. They are fully worthy of any fairy story or goblin story. So I, I made up a town over there in the Hood Canal area. I didn't want to use a real town. You can do that with big cities and books, but small towns, it starts getting a little too personal. So I made up Bellwater, which sounded to me like the name of a Puget Sound town. 
and also you can spell it pretty easily. <laughs> Although, FYI, Spellcheck always wants to turn it into bellwether. <laughs> I can tell when people email me if it says bellwether, I like, Spellcheck did that to you, I know. <laughs> Then I had to figure out my protagonists. So I obviously would start with two sisters. Now in the, in the poem, their names are Lizzie and Laura, but that wasn't going to do. That was too similar, and I kept mixing them up when I was reading the poem. So in my version, Lizzie is now Livy, short for Olivia, the responsible older sister, and the younger sister is Skye, who gets caught by the goblins and thrown under a spell. Livy and Skye are in their 20s, and my editor and I went back and forth with the ages a little. I originally had Livy in her 30s and Skye in her 20s, but putting them both in their 20s means the book can qualify better for the new adult demographic, which is a step above young adult, but not quite adult. Uh, and that's apparently a desirable thing. I don't entirely believe in demographics because I think people read what they like to read and plenty of adults, and including me, read Harry Potter and so forth. But I went along with it. However, for what it's worth, if you want to think of Livy as being in her 30s when you read it, you have my blessing. <laughs> um, as was brought up in my bio, I always want to write a love story. The original poem does say that the sisters end up becoming wives and telling their children about the goblins, so I figured it was safe to pair them up with some guys. Plus, I wanted to play with all that sensuality in the poem, it's almost aphrodisiac effects of the goblin spell, which I definitely did. However, unlike a lot of ro uh, paranormal romances, this book is not a romance between a human and a paranormal creature, a goblin in this case, which mind you has been a disappointment to some people, especially those who've seen the film Labyrinth with um, David Bowie as the hot goblin king. They were really hoping for some hot goblin men in this book, and there, there aren't any. <laughs> anyway, we couldn't top Bowie. Why would I even try? <laughs> now, certainly in some other stories, I've written Mortal Falls for Paranormal Being plenty of times, in fact, but I wanted to do something different this time. So I, I felt like having humanity be a desirable quality in contrast to these eerie, unpredictable goblins. So despite having said back in 2011 that these days it would have to be maiden, conflicted, goblins, sparkly, and heartthrobby, I didn't end up writing it that way. I more or less did end up going with maiden good, goblin evil, which is in keeping with the poem. So the goblins in my poem, in the poem and in my version, and in most folklore that you'll read about them, are not the nicest of fairy creatures. They usually do get counted as a type of fairy or, or fae creature, but there's a big spectrum among the fae. They can be anything ranging from benevolent to deadly, and goblins are usually much closer to the deadly side. They are ugly, violent, mischievous, amoral, and greedy. They laugh a lot, they have fun, but they're definitely laughing at you, not with you. I decided that where these goblins live is up in the tops of trees, in the forests. If you ever looked way up at the tops of our tallest trees, our Douglas firs and cedars and spruces, and wondered what it would be like up there? I mean, maybe you think about that all the time, but it occurred to me that I very seldom look at the tops of trees and really think about it. It's already, therefore, kind of another world that we'll never visit, unless we're arborists or those extreme tree climbing people. So I put the goblins up there. They have a treetop village, but it's built largely from stuff they've stolen from humans because stealing stuff from humans is one of their absolute favorite things to do. <laughs> However, even if you climbed up to the tops of the trees in the Olympic Peninsula, in my version of things, you still wouldn't just see these goblin dwellings. You couldn't just reach them. The Fey world, I decided, would be difficult to see or get to, which is how it's described in a lot of fairy lore. You, you know, it's there, it's in the forest and waters and nature, but you don't usually see it or hear it. It's sort of like another dimension. It's often said that between twilight and dawn, night time and almost dark, is when you're likelier to see such creatures, so I, I went with that rule too. And the lore also usually says that they won't just appear for anyone. They'll appear if they feel like it, but the chances go up a little if you're showing respect and asking to see them. And I kept to that rule too. 
Uh, but when it's these goblins, there's a sinister, sinister aspect. They'll also only appear if you're alone, and it's night, and you have something they want to steal. It might just be one of your possessions. They, they especially love gold. So if you have gold jewelry, that would be a likely thing. But it might be you. In fairy lore, fairies have been known to steal people. The old stories say that if you see a procession of fairies at night, or a path leading into a fairy hill, and you decide to join them, all bets are off as to you ever coming home again. You might be taken into the Fey realm forever. Or like Rip Van Winkle and others, you might spend what you thought was one night there and come back and find it had been years and years in the human world. And again, we could pause and speculate. These stories were creative warnings against getting lost in the woods, eaten by wild animals, kidnapped by strangers, etc., which they probably were. But I'm also intrigued by the surface story, where there's an actual parallel fey realm into which you could wander and maybe get stuck forever, if you weren't careful. And you might even be physically changed and turned into one of them. And that's the danger that befalls Skye, the younger sister in my book. She sees a line of glowing mushrooms leading into the forest one night, and she's curious and follows it. She's a modern person, so she doesn't know about fae and goblins, and she therefore doesn't know that if you do that, you're accepting their invitation. So once she's down that path, they catch her. They make her taste the fruits. Then they let her go, but after that, she's not herself anymore. She can't speak of what happened to her. That's a common problem with magic spells, which I decided to use. And therefore, her sister Livy is very concerned and distressed and trying to understand what's the matter with her. But of course, eventually, and with the help or sometimes hindrance of two young men in town, they realize what they're up against and they have to work out how to unenchant Sky, which won't be easy because it's no fun if magic is too easy. So as you can tell, this is not exactly a Disney variety of fairy story. <laughs> It's not even really a labyrinth variety of fairy or goblin story, although there is a connection of sorts there because the goblins and other little creatures in the labyrinth movie were designed by Brian Frude, also Jim Henson, but, and Brian Frude wrote lots of books of fairies like this one. You might, everyone's probably got this one, it's beautiful. And he helped design the labyrinth goblins too. And basically, Brian Frude's uh, fairies are what I've always pictured as my version of the fae creatures. They're beautiful, but they aren't necessarily beautiful in human ways. They can be, you know, creepy animal things. The, the drawings are very beautiful, but very disturbing. And I like that they are like nature come to life, essentially, much more than just very pretty humans or anything. So as nature come to life is how I've pictured all my creatures too. It's a bit of a metaphor that way. Because nature, as we all know, can also be benevolent and deadly and anything in between. Accordingly, I, I have a range of fake creatures representing all those possibilities. And in trying to save Sky, Livy has to call on the less deadly ones for help, even though she didn't know they existed until now. Because you see, she's a forest service scientist, so she's naturally very skeptical, but luckily it also means she has the proper respect for the environment, which will give her uh, a little more respect from the Fae, and they might be more willing to help her. I feel like my stories are always on the weird side, one way or another. But this one is one of, one of my especially weird ones, <laughs> and that is <laughs> in keeping with the tone of the poem, is, is what I would say. The poem is eerie and sensual in a mix that makes you kind of uncomfortable. And I did the same with my book. I didn't do the exact same ways as the poem, but I carried over that mood. It's, it's got love stories, but they aren't exactly sweet and swoony love stories, not compared to some of mine or others. There's love and dating and sex, but it's definitely under some strange circumstances. So, which is why it's kind of funny to me that this has been the one that's gotten the most attention so far out of all my books. I mean, we're still not talking a bestseller list, I'm still a small press author and all that, but it's gotten more bookstore orders and more pre-release reviews than my other ones. 
and it's that's been a surprising turn of events and I'm not totally sure how to attribute it except that probably this amazing gorgeous cover art helped a lot I, I get to heap praise on it because I didn't design it my editor Michelle did at Central Avenue Publishing and I basically just got to okay it and say yeah that's really pretty oh I like that font so <laughs> Everyone loves this cover, and so while we wish we could say people don't judge or buy books based on their covers, well, they do. Yeah. And in any case, having more people discover it than before has meant, yes, that a lot of them have been weirded out and aren't really sure they liked it, but it's also meant a lot of new people who do like this kind of weirdness have discovered my stories for the first time. And to them I say, welcome. You are my tribe. I have so much more weirdness to share with you yet. Thank you. I, I welcome your questions and comments. Thank you. Well, I yes. am a real nerd, novice in this field. Mm -hmm. What is a goblin? What is a goblin? Is that to you to design? It is kind of. Um, they are basically considered kind of low and a little golem-ish is how I've pictured it. Is they, they're sort of earthy and again grumpy and they often they like to steal things. I, I remember in Harry Potter they had the goblins be the bankers because they they're so fond of gold. So they were being really crabby and such, but they were trustworthy enough in Harry Potter to be the bankers. But in others, I think they're in Tolkien too. There's goblins, and I believe they were not very nice. I can't recall. <laughs> I think they were not. <laughs> Yes. Again, they, they often live underground. I, I put them in the trees and that's a little different. But uh, yeah, they are, they're among the more mischievous, earthier. They're not the kind of fairies that fly around or grant you wishes. They usually are just going to be stealing and be doing mischief. And sometimes they're kind of too. Yeah, sometimes you hear of ones that sound almost more like trolls. But sometimes they're a little... Yeah, I don't know who that, that was a different guy. I just kind of opened it and found that guy. But yeah, I would, Brian Freud comes up with just tons. But he has a book. He has a book that's actually just goblins. I should have brought that. Yeah. Oh, look, there we go. There they are. Goblins. Oh. <laughs> it says they are a breed of small, swarthy, malicious beings. Sometimes appear in the shape of animals, which appropriately reflects their bestial nature. They're the thieves and villains of fairy, companions to the dead, especially on Halloween. More than this, goblins are tempters, often using forbidden fairy fruits to lure victims to their doom. And there he quotes Rossetti's poem. <laughs> we must not look at goblin men, we must not buy their fruits. <laughs> yes. Well, it sounds like a really fun book to read. Do you have a recommendation <laughs> for an age group? An age group? Um, I generally say that something like 16 on up is fine. The, the protagonists are in their 20s, and originally I thought of them as 30s and 20s. I actually, when I started writing it, I deliberately didn't want it to be young adults. I had written the Greek myth trilogy, which was about like mostly 18 to 21 year olds, and I was getting kind of tired of the young adult feel, but then I sort of got talked into it being new adult anyway, so. <laughs> I think it's fine for 16 on up. Yes? Does the Bellwater mm -hmm. make a beautiful water, like, like the mm -hmm. with the I pictured it, I didn't ever define in the book why it's called that, but I, I, in my mind I feel like it's because the water is clear as a bell. You know how some, some of those inlets are so smooth and clear and how beautiful water. That's my personal interpretation, though it never says that in the book. It could be that there was a founder of the town named Bellwater. <laughs> Sometimes the water, when, when you cross over a water, mm -hmm. it breaks a spell or... Yeah, That's true. That's true. There's, there's a certain right. There's some be some fairies that you can escape by crossing water. Yeah. And that's interesting that you bring that up because there is in the book an island, like one of those little teeny islands we have in Puget Sound, which has a bridge to it. But and one of the guys lives there and sort of feels like he can kind of get a break from the goblins if he's over there. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe yeah, there's something to that. <laughs> yes. I, I didn't think I knew much about goblins at all. I like other monsters, but I didn't know too much. But, but as you were speaking of, 
I know a lot of goblins. <laughs> <laughs> and, they sound familiar. And, yeah, <laughs> the one I'm wondering if you know this one, it's a 70s movie, it's Don't mm -hmm. Be Afraid of the Dark, and they remade it, but it was a like a 70s movie of the week, and, wow. and these things live inside the old fireplace. And mm. <laughs> some famous, oh, uh, Guillermo de Toro, I think, Guillermo redid de Toro. it. Yeah. Oh, really? Or he, he had something to do with the re I, think, oh, I bet that's but creepy. the original, yeah. in all of its dated, bad <laughs> 70s, was, I was, I, I wonder if, yeah, I was just wondering. No, if I that never heard of that goblin. one. I think it was a goblin. It might be. They often are the, right, one of the nastier ones. Yeah, it so. would be that. <laughs> Could be. It's funny. They, they were pretty nice in Labyrinth, all things considered. But they did still steal a sibling in that one, too. Once I thought about it, Labyrinth actually kind of follows the goblin market scheme, too. Get one sibling stolen by the goblin king, and the other sibling has to go save him. <laughs> yes? What is a common doom that goblins bring to the doom? I get the feeling that, well, at least from reading Brian Fruit and such, usually they're just going to steal stuff and kind of mess things up for you and wreak havoc. They might not actually damage you personally. But uh, I went with, well, in Goblin Market, though, which was more what I was basing it on, it seems that they were, they had put some sort of wasting sickness on her that made her want nothing but to see the goblins again and that she would have died away if it weren't for being rescued. So. And another analogy that I kind of played with the, in this is that it sounded like depression and that that maybe was another thing it was an interpretation for, that these days if you had had this spell put on you, people would probably say you, you had depression. But uh, yeah, it's, in any case, that in my book then I decided that if, if not fixed, she would eventually go back out to the woods and be turned into one of the goblins forever. And that this has happened before to other people. That, they were stolen away from humanity, and that's why they are now goblins. <laughs> Which isn't, yeah, it's, once you've become a goblin, it's probably fine. You get to live forever, and you don't care about anything, and, but you've lost your humanity, and your family's lost too. <laughs> yes. Molly, I think you've met your children before, and I think you have them. They're darting around, I've seen them. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've seen so they're not goblins, they're just the children. <laughs> They might steal your stuff, but I don't think it's... <laughs> I'm curious to know how much of your book you shared with them, how much of your um, head you shared with them, or they share with you. You're yeah. encouraging that sort of talk, maybe in your home with kids. You see, love that. <laughs> this one I didn't get into too much. I thought it was, I was a little more grown up, but when I was writing the Greek myth trilogy, we were also reading, we read some uh, Rick Riordan's... Um, Percy Jackson books, which are very well, you know, very lots of fun about replaying the Greek mythology, and so it gave me a chance to say, yeah, I wrote about the Persephone story too, and here's the whole story about that. And <laughs> I don't think they really know what I did with it so much yet. I assume once they're teenagers, they'll have more patience for the level of chapter book that I write. <laughs> but um, yeah, we talk about that. Do their imaginations roam that way? Sometimes, yeah, once in a while, they'll say something really thinking outside the box. <laughs> I like that. Nobody else weird in their family. Definitely. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's my hope. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Steve. <laughs> I like one of the twists that you had the goblins not be from that geography originally. Yeah. I, I like that that piece of don't think of the fairy world kind of moving around where humans have gone you know, mm -hmm. every which way. This is the, I couldn't think of many instances of the fairy realm moving geography. <laughs> How'd you come up with I remember, that? I do remember that Neil Gaiman's American Gods kind of has that going on, I think, where like the, the gods of each part of the world followed the immigrants to America. And so there's all these different gods from all over the world kind of jostling together in America because they were brought over by the immigrants. <laughs> So it's a little like that with the goblins. I also, you know, I wanted them to be symbolic of nature, but then since they were kind of evil, I didn't want to be saying, well, and nature is evil, 
So I decided that what they were was an invasion, invasive species. So they're like the blackberries that we keep having to tear out of. They're like the ivy. They, they got pulled over here from Europe and they won't leave. <laughs> there are local fae though, who are the native species who would like them gone too, but weeds are very powerful. So it's been hard to get rid of them. And that's, that's why the local species are a little more willing to help too, is that this is an invasive species and they're annoying. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh well, I always have. It's um, not well, not Hood Canal specifically, but very near there. My family's had a, a, a beach cabin since before I was born, so I've been going out there to Mason County, and yeah, it was yeah when I was coming up with something to write next before starting this one, we were out there for vacation again, and I thought I've never set a book here. This is like one of my favorite places in the world, and I haven't given it proper attention. So I, I gave the setting a lot of attention and love, and described how beautiful the smooth green water is and the huge tall trees and the moss and mushrooms and because we all love that up here and yes however weird the relationships are the setting is beloved <laughs> see that's the feeling i get from the cover too like you said yeah. the dark wood and yet the bright yeah. green yeah feathers and berries yeah. and twigs and evergreen forests <laughs> yes No, I didn't make a different language, which I know I'm a linguist. I feel like I'm not living up to Tolkien by <laughs> not making up all these languages all the time. I, I assume they did used to speak European languages once, if they were once people in Europe. In fact, I gave a brief backstory to one of them who was from France from a while ago, so she must have spoken French. But uh, I didn't give them a, a special goblin language. They speak English. I assume, my assumption is that the Fae can speak to humans if they want to in whatever the humans speak, and they can ignore them if they want to, they not <laughs> show up at all, if that's what they feel like. But it's sometimes hard to read when you're in yeah. a book that... You can flip into the glossary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know, that's that's one of my stumbling points too. I didn't want it to be like, how do you pronounce that? Why did you do this to me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fun as it might be to make up a language. Right. <laughs> What's next? Sense. What's next? Yeah. Um, I'm almost done. I'm going through edits. It's something entirely different. It's a romantic comedy with no magic at all, and it's a love story between two guys. So it's, you know, it should be fun and silly. And then actually, I probably will go back to magic for the one after that. I have an outline drawn up. It might be about fae type again, but I'm going to put them somewhere else, like an imaginary island that still our world, but an island that doesn't actually exist. So that's, that's my current idea, is to put all that together. <laughs> you encourage your imagination. Yes! And your writing. <laughs> it keeps me sane. <laughs> Have you read the Life of Pi? No, I, ha I keep hearing it recommended. It sounds like I'm better. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah? Oh, okay. Imaginary Islands. Imaginary yeah. Islands are a whole separate almost a trope that, well, you know, there's Avalon, there's Atlantis, there's, yeah. It's almost hard to find, and <laughs> I love that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely then. <laughs> I didn't realize there was an island. I knew there was a tiger or something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're running loose. Oh, good. <laughs>
guess they have to put it to me, yeah. Yeah, and if they don't have it here, then they have to put it to me. Where did they put it? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so thank you again for being here. You're the first third timer, I think, oh, that we've had. Wow. We, we've been in business here uh, with Words Writers in West Seattle for four years now. I got and it on yeah, it was a, I had to look you up, and it was um, 2015 that we didn't hear from you, I guess, right? Is that right? There was a break in the middle of the trip. You mentioned that in your presentation. Yeah. That, yeah. So I think that's what it was. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And we appreciate you being part of the family and part of this program. I appreciate it very much. All right. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.